one of the things that's really distinctive about the greatest investors and probably the people who are the greatest at everything is they're self-aware enough that they say, yeah, I'm not going to play that game. That's not one that suits my talents. It's not one that suits my temperament. And then you want to focus really obsessively on that area that is important to you. This doesn't just apply to investing, it applies to every area of life to think, what am I optimized for? Like stick to games that you can win. Think about the destination. Think about what you want to become, the type of person you want to be in terms of your health, in terms of your career, in terms of your relationships, in terms of your finances, your financial independence, and then work backwards and think about what's going to get me there. What are the inputs? And then pick a handful of habits. Buffett often talks about the importance of saying no to almost everything. He just sticks with what he's good at and his way of operating, his way of thinking. When you're in various states, like being hungry, angry, lonely, tired, in pain or stress, you make terrible decisions. You're, you're kind of primed to make terrible decisions. So just being aware that your decision making about your future, about how to talk to your boss, about how to talk to your employee, about how to talk to your, your partner, your kid, your dog, whatever, or, or what investment to make is actually going to affect you. So one of the most important things you want to do both in investing and life is to take control over your inner life. And so we don't have control over inflation. We don't have control over whether the market's going up or not. Anyone who tends that they can even predict whether the market is going up or what inflation is going to be or where war is going to break out is either fooling you or fooling themselves. So these are things we don't have control over. And so what you want to focus on is the stuff that you do control. What's up, Believe Nation? In today's interview, I get to sit down with the famous author, William Green. He's best known for writing the book, Richer, Wiser, Happier, which exactly covers that. If you want to be richer, wiser, and happier, then you need to read this book. I've read this book maybe five times now. And basically, William Green covers and interviews the most famous investors who and their path to growing wealth, wisdom, and happiness. So if that is interesting to you, then you need to sit back, relax, and hear the insights of William Green. Enjoy. I've read your book three times now. This year alone, just listening to it on audiobook and walking in the forest and, you know, just binge watching it three times now. So it's definitely been my favorite book. So I'm just so oh, wow. excited to, to connect with you. Um, <laughs> Thank you. That's lovely to hear. I'd highly recommend for people who are watching to definitely check it out. But I'm very curious uh, on your book, Richer, Wiser, Happier. What was the, the key thing that made you write it in the first place? Gosh, well, it took me so long to write. It, it <laughs> took me about five years to write. So, so I have to cast my mind back for years. But, but what, what basically happened is I'd been interviewing these great investors in a fairly scattershot way over about 20 or so years. And so I would interview someone like Jack Bogle 20 years ago, who is the founder of Vanguard, which now manages over $7 trillion. And they're, they're, he, he's kind of the king of index funds. He, he, he kind of invented that movement, basically. Or I'd interview someone like Peter Lynch, this, this legendary investor from Fidelity who had this astonishing record for something like 13 years and then quit at the top of the game. So yeah, I would go off to the Bahamas and spend a day with Sir John Templeton, who was pro probably the greatest stock picker, global stock picker of the 20th century. So I'd had all of these interviews over the years. And, and then a few years ago, probably about six or seven years ago, I started to realize there's something actually quite special going on here that these guys, and, and they are, I'm embarrassed to say, usually guys, they uh, usually old or middle-aged white guys um, uh, to an embarrassing degree. They think in a way that's really valuable and they're extremely pragmatic and, and they'll basically do anything that works to give them an advantage. So they'll study any field, whether it's Buddhist meditation techniques or the science of habit or um, just studying how to think better or studying history or economics or anything, behavioral psychology. And so they're kind of an amazing filter to view the whole world because unlike most of us, most of us are just sort of scattershot and we'll, you know, we react to whatever comes along. These guys, they're thinking about how to give themselves an edge in every area of life. And I, I hadn't really read anyone writing about this in a systematic way. And I was thinking, well, how can I actually be a, a kind of bridge to the regular person to say, look, you really want to understand what people like Templeton figured out, what Charlie Munger, who's Buffett's 
98 year old polymathic genius of a partner figured out because they'll actually help you to think better. And, and then the really strange and counterintuitive thing that I decided to write about at a certain point was I was thinking, well, yeah, they can help you get rich, but actually they can help you live more wisely. And that's a really counterintuitive argument because usually we, we watch things like succession or billions and we look at these people and we think, God, they're such snakes. And my two and favorite shows. <laughs> they are good shows, aren't they? <laughs> and, and they just create chaos and lawsuits and they're totally rapacious and horrible human beings. Yeah, I'm much more interested in the this this subset of people on, on Wall Street who have what Charlie Munger refers to as worldly wisdom. And so they're actually thinking about how to live. So they're thinking about these issues of, well, what's actually going to make for a successful and abundant life? Is it going to be just maximizing the amount of money I make? And so I'm a total snake and leaving a trail of destruction and lawsuits in my wake? Or, or should I be thinking about how to give the money away? What's actually going to make my life happy? Or should I behave ethically? Is there is it a disadvantage in life to behave ethically or actually an advantage because you attract better people into your orbit? And so they're thinking quite philosophically about these issues. And so I became just consumed by this idea. And I just thought, that's pretty cool. If I can, if I can try to provide almost an investor's guide to life, you know, so it's not just about how to, how to invest and get rich, but actually about how to live. So it was a madly ambitious project. And, and once I started it, I was like, oh, what have I done? Why, how, did I, how did I get myself into this deep mud? And it was like it, it was like climbing a sort of series of about 10 different Everests because there are probably about 10 or 11 chapters. And so each one was like, yeah, now I'll, now I'll explain how you should deal with the fact that everything is impermanent and life changes and you can't predict the future. So it's like these massive topics. Uh, so so that that was what in, inspired me. And yeah, your book was uh, a beautiful crossover of uh, personal development and investing. Um, you know, two of my favorite subjects, which is I think why I've binged it so many times. Okay. Oh, <laughs> um, but uh, so I, yeah, definitely very successful in, in accomplishing that goal. Um, and but, is there uh, anything that you actually changed in the way that in, in terms of your own habits? Is there anything you took out of it that you thought, yeah, I should actually do that in my life? Yeah, uh, the the biggest thing is well, a couple big things is some of the things that impacted me the most was you know Nick Sleep's philosophy on like returning money to shareholders when the the fund was getting too too big, mm. <laughs> and making sure that his morals were directly tied with his results, um, and it's not just about money like you're saying. How do you capture as, as much as possible? Um, and then really thinking about a lot of like the, the, the traits you laid out in the book, because my goal in life is actually to become a great investor myself. Hmm. And so trying to model after the people you laid out, um, how they think, you know, Howard Marks calls it the second level thinking, hmm. um, and, and how each of the people you just refer to have an innovation stack almost of like you know, uh, someone is amazing at philosophy and history and, and mathematics, while the other person is personal development and um, uh, more so political sciences. And, and so trying to figure out what would be based on my skill sets, my innovation stack, what would I love to give me a competitive edge? Um, yeah, and would... that, that's such an important idea that, that I think one of, one of the things that I came to believe really strongly after spending a lot of time with all of these people is you have to think really carefully about what you bring to the game about playing playing the hand that you've been dealt and so I think one of the things that's extraordinary about all of these people is that they're, they're kind of avoiding games that they can't win and they're focusing on games that they can win so that so for someone, for someone like Howard Marks, for example, he's not really a, a, this is a guy who manages something like $160 billion he oversees. And he's this, this very brilliant cerebral guy. He's not a great optimist or visionary. He doesn't look at the future and think everything's going to be golden. So he's kind of a pessimist. He ended up investing in things like distressed debt in, in the debt of companies that were in, were in trouble because there's a contract there and you actually knew what, 
what you'd get. And so there's a degree of predictability. Whereas if he were a venture capitalist, for example, he was just betting on hot tech companies that might one day live up to these blue sky dreamy promises of the, the salesman behind them. That would totally not suit his character. And so I think part of the trick is to look at yourself really, really honestly with self-awareness and say, what am I built to do in life? Like, what game can I actually play that I'll be successful at? And Buffett often talks about the importance of saying no to almost everything. The, the, he just he he just sticks with what he's good at and his way of operating and his way of thinking. And so I think there's a lot to unpack and discuss in that idea. But that that to me has had a really profound effect because I start to think, for example, like people people will say, "Oh, you're a writer. You should do a Substack newsletter." And I'm like, "Yeah, but I'm slow and ponderous and." And I think, and I'm kind of obsessive and obsessively perfectionist, and I take a long time. The last thing I should be do, doing is pumping out material. I should, be, I should be trying to create something that's kind of beautiful and deeply thought through and well-honed and well-crafted. And so it's a slow game. And so for me to say, I, I'm not going to be one of those people like, um, uh, like like Lee, Lee Child, right? Who pumps out a novel once a year. It's like, <laughs> if I can write three more books, five more books in the course of a long life, that would be a triumph. And so I think for all of your listeners, this doesn't just apply to investing, it applies to every area of life to think, what am I optimized for? What Like stick to games that you can win. And that doesn't mean you don't want to get better at things that you're not good at. But I think, if you if you look back, Jeremy, at what it was like being at school, like I, I have kids, right? I have a twenty three year old son who's about to turn twenty four, and a twenty one year old daughter, and so much of their time at school, particularly for my daughter, was focused on the things that she wasn't good at, like math, like um, sort of re remedial stuff to get you up to up to uh, an acceptable level at something you were always going to be kind of crap at. Yeah. And she's incredibly talented and a wonderful writer and writes music beautifully and teaches herself new instruments. And she was spending so much time on the things that she wasn't good at that she didn't actually have time to, to do the stuff that she was good at. And she, you know, she, would, she would go sing in Carnegie Hall with like Bruce Springsteen and Sting and stuff like that. I mean, you know, she was singing at an amazing level, but, but she never could be in the choir at school or anything like that or even have time for music lessons because she was busy doing math. Yeah. And trying to catch up with math. And so once you're an adult, I think you really want to focus a lot on saying, this is what I'm built for. This is the game I'm going to win. And, and with investing, one of the things you want to do is say, am I built to outperform the market? Am I built to have extraordinary returns? Do I have the emotional wiring of these great investors? Do I have the interest? And am, am I obsessive enough? And one of the things I came to the conclusion about after spending so much time with these people is, I'm actually not built that way. I'm much more fearful. I'm much more anxious than mm. the best investors. And so it's very hard for me to outperform. I have certain characteristics that are really good as an investor. Like, like I'm extremely patient. It's, I mean, I know you recently interviewed my friend Guy Spear. I've been invested with Guy Spear for more than 20 years. That, that's a tremendous advantage to have that patience. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't want to sit around reading annual reports and stuff like that. I can't think of anything more tedious. But I was I was going to ask you about that actually. Um, regarding, you know, uh, was it was it just a lack of maybe innate wiring that made you not want to become uh, an investor, or was it a matter of listen, I don't want to put forty hours per week plus into reading annual reports. So I was very curious. To, um, yeah, I, well, I mean, look at look at the bookshelf behind me in this. I, I assume this is just a video and not an audio thing. But I mean, look, if I yeah. if I turn this here, right? So these are books that I'm sort of working on at the moment. So at the top there, there are three book, two books that came yesterday. One of them is called The Way of the Bodhisattva. And one of them is called Vivid Awareness. And then there's one called Profound Simplicity and The Naked Now, which is a sort of, uh, you know, in the surrender experiment. And I am that, and 
the collected works of Ramana Maharshi, I mean, these are mainly spiritual things or philosophical or historical or, I mean, they're weird. And so <laughs> I had three books like that arrive yesterday. My, my wife opens the package from Amazon and she's like, more Buddhist crap, basically. <laughs> You know, I, she didn't really put it by, like that, but that was the subtext. And and I'm not a Buddhist. I just study this stuff obsessively and I'm really interested in it. So I, I think you you need you need to harness your own craziness in life, your own particular form of idiosyncrasy. So for me, I may not have the patience to sit around reading annual reports, but I can spend five months on that chapter on Nick's sleep getting it to a point where there's no word that I would change. And so there's a degree of absolute obsessiveness that makes no sense at all rationally. I sometimes wondered if my obsessiveness in perfecting a sentence as much as I could was actually a form of self-soothing, that in a, in a crazy world where we don't control that much, I could sit at my desk and I could go over a sentence or a paragraph to a point where it felt perfect to me. It kind of reflected what was going on in my mind, um, this sort of difficult thought in a perfect way. So there was a, there was a degree of, of craziness and self-soothing that, you know, and then also, I mean, I'd studied English literature at Oxford and I went to Columbia Journalism School and I spent the last 50 years reading obsessively. So it just kind of plays to my strengths. It's my game. And I love interviewing people and talking. And so and I'm always trying to figure out kind of the meaning of life and what's going on. So, so writing a book like this just played to my strengths to a ridiculous degree, although I did miss my deadline by two years. So in that <laughs> sense, it didn't. Um, and so, so yeah, I, I, think, I think one of the things that's really distinctive about the greatest investors and probably the people who are the greatest at everything is they're self-aware enough that they say, yeah, I'm not going to play that game. That's not one that suits my talents, it's not one that suits my temperament. And then you wanna focus really obsessively on that area that is important to you. And I think I, I, I write a lot about um, high performance habits in the book. And one of, one of the things that I think is very valuable that, that these guys do that I think we can apply in any area of our lives is they remove a lot of complexity from their life. So they it's not just that you're focusing on the game that you can win. It's that then you remove a lot of this other complexity and noise from your life. So if you think about how superficial and, and how superficial and narrow, well, actually narrow is the wrong word, how superficial most of our lives are, right? We're, we're constantly being dinged by notifications. I'm obsessed with things like Twitter and, uh, you know, because it's important as a writer, right? You're kind of building a tribe and you're sharing your ideas. But so you have this very shallow life where you're um, not in a pejorative kind of critical way, but it's just like you're responding constantly to emails, text messages, Twitter notifications, LinkedIn messages. And so there's a lot of busyness without much depth. And I think one of the superpowers in life that I see in a lot of the most successful investors is this ability to go kind of narrow and deep. And so you remove all of the complexity and then you find this area where you have what Buffett would call your circle of competence. And you keep expanding that circle of competence. So if, if for example, you, you don't understand tech stocks, you start to study technology and you start to study cryptocurrencies because you're like, well, it's a new thing. I, I can't just deny that it exists. Um, so you need to expand your, your circle of competence. But at the same time, you're going really deep and removing a lot of that unnecessary noise and unnecessary complexity. And also unnecessary short-termism. So if you think about how short-term most of our lives are, it's not just the information we consume. It's also, it's everything really, right? Everything is on demand, right? Uh, you have infinite TV on demand, infinite infinite um infinite porn infinite food infinite music everything is available right now and so this is one of the things i wrote about in writing about um nick sleep and his partner case sicaria is that part of their gift part of their advantage both in investing and life is their ability to think long term and to defer gratification and so while everyone else 
is going shallow and short term and kind of widespread and scattershot, there they would say, okay, we're going to focus on information that has a long shelf life, for example. So they would say, we don't we don't really care about the daily news, or we don't care about what they dismissively call wiggle guessing in terms of stocks. So most people are focusing on this, and they're like, yeah, this went up here, and this happened today, and all the nonsense that you see on CNBC, right, where it's like um, uh, projections about what's going to happen today because of this, and it's just noise. And so the ability to tune out noise and focus on what actually matters becomes a superpower, both in investing and life. And so what, what Nick Sleep would do is he would say, for example, um, let's think about what would make a business really successful. And so you look at something like Amazon or Costco, and he would say, and both of which he's made a fortune on. I mean, he invested in in Amazon incredibly early and has owned it for like 16, 17, 18 years. It's, it's the majority of his own personal portfolio is in it. And so he would say, okay, well, what's, what's a desirable destination for a business like this? And so he'd say, well, okay, so they need to, uh, he, he, for it to become what Bezos says it could become, uh, that, that, that would be like this. Okay, so what are the inputs that will get it to be there? Um, how do they need to treat their customers? How do they need to handle logistics? How do, they, how do they need to handle returns? How do they need to drive down prices? How do they need to treat their employees? Are they doing these things? And so they would call this destination analysis. So you focus on the destination, a desirable destination, and then you work backwards. So that's a very different way of thinking than everyone who's doing this wiggle guessing, just listening to all this noise and reacting. Here's Nick saying, no, let me think about the desirable destination and are they doing what will get, there, get them there in 5, 10, 15, 20 years? And the beauty of this is that you can apply it to your own career and your own life as well. So you can say, okay, if I want to be successful and financially independent and secure, so I don't have to take in orders from any idiotic boss who I don't like or, or work in a job that I dislike, what am I going to have to do? What does that desirable destination look like? And then let me work backwards. Mm. So then if you think about the inputs to get you there, you're like, well, so I better live within my means. I better save aggressively. Uh, I better invest intelligently. I better try to keep my investing expenses low. So if, if my expenses on brokerage trades or high fees from funds eat away at my returns, I'm not going to reach that desirable destination of being financially independent and secure and not beholden to anyone, and not vulnerable if it's the fan and the world goes through a difficult recession or a war or something like that. And so just that, that, that simple filter of thinking about destination, long-term destination, how to get there, is so powerful and it's so different from the kind of, the kind of short-termism and reactiveness of most people's approach to life. So what I'm trying to do is highlight some of these principles that work in investing in life so that at least once you understand that, okay, so you, I'm still going to be dinged by Twitter notifications and the like, and, and I'm still going to be um, short term, and I'm still, I'm still subject to all of these dopamine hits, like, yeah, I'll have another piece of toast with honey on it and, <laughs> and, a, and an extra donut or whatever. Um, but at least I'll be, at least I'll understand what the game is. At least I'll understand that the more I push things towards long-term decisions, um, towards focusing on what will get me to a good destination, the more of a competitive advantage I have both in investing and life. Mm -hmm. Most well, people just don't know. They don't know that these principles are important. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's very much, um, you know, uh, li listening to you speak right now, reading your book, it, it just it instantly tied to just being, uh, as Nassim Taleb says, anti-fragile, right? Yeah. 20 and 30 year olds will be watching this for the most part. And, you know, so many people in the workforce and the marketplace just feel like they don't have an edge. They, it, it's, it's an age of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And, and like you said, these, these instant dopamine hits of get anything you want is making it even harder than ever. But for those who can tap into finding their self-awareness, whether that is, um, 
And I'm curious to hear how maybe you do this and what you've seen other investors do and how they tap into that reflective process. I know some meditate. I think it was John Templeton who would go in the ocean and do exercises. And if that was a reflective process for him. So um, I think people having maybe an internal, even if it's 30 minutes a day, I'm I'm curious to know uh, if you have a process and um, that that you find works really well for you. And this is really important for me because as you can probably tell already, Jeremy, I have a scattered mind. My mind's all over the place. My, you know, my bookshelf looks like it's going to collapse, right? That's a, that's a pretty good um, representation of my mind. Uh, It's, it's sort of, I mean, it's kind of a glorious disaster. And so, um, which is, yeah, it's a bit, it's a, it's a bit like the state of my, my brain. And so, so I think a lot about how do you, how do you find equanimity and peace within the chaos of the world? And, and this, is a, this is a really important question because it really affects everything from the way you invest to the way you treat your, um, your parents, your kids, your husband or wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your co-workers. I mean, if you're, if you're emotionally flooded you make crap decisions if you're stressed you make crap decisions i i have a friend who i write about in the book a guy um who's um a, an expert on the brain ken schubenstein who who not only was a terrific investor who taught the advanced investment research course at, at uh, columbia for many years but um also now is a is a neurologist uh so he's actually treating people's brains so he's obsessed with the subject of the brain and one thing that he said to me is when you're in various states, like being hungry, angry, lonely, tired, in pain, or stressed, you make terrible decisions. You're you're kind of primed to make terrible decisions. So just being aware that your decision making about your future, about how to talk to your boss, about how to talk to your employee, about how to talk to your, your partner, your kid, your dog, whatever, or, or what investment to make, that your your physiological state is actually going to affect you. That's a really profound realization. So one of the most important things you want to do both in investing and life is to take control over your inner life. And so we don't really have control over what's going to happen in Ukraine. We don't have control over inflation. We don't have control over whether the market's going up or not. Anyone who pretends that they can even predict whether the market is going up or what inflation is going to be or where war is going to break out is either fooling you or fooling themselves. And so these are things we don't have control over. And so what you want to focus on is the stuff that you do control. Like, like, am I able to create emotional equanimity within, within the chaos? So I, I mean, literally, I have, I have a post-it on my, on my wall here. I have a lot of post-its on my wall. One of them um, to something from a, a, a great Buddhist teacher called Sokni Rinpoche, who, who talks about um, just sitting within the fluidity without judgment. And so that's something, that's an idea from meditation where you're just, you're just sitting there calmly with everything going on. You're just sitting there and you're not judging. You're not saying, I hate this. I feel so stressed. I need to change this. I, I'm so anxious. You're watching your anxiety and you're watching your fear, and you're watching your upset. I had someone cancel an interview on me at the last minute yesterday, and I meditated afterwards, and I was sitting there, and I, I think the, the phrase that came to my mind was a terrible phrase. It was something like, um, uh, I'm an afterthought, um, uh, eat, eating crumbs from, from, the, the, ta- from the, the table of great men, or something like that. It was a terrible image that came up in this sort of silence where you're sitting, and you're like, oh, wow, all right, really? That's how you feel at the moment, like that? that irrelevant and that much of a schmuck and a loser because this guy just canceled the interview. I'm like, okay. And so what this guy, Sotny Rinpoche would say is that, that you would do what he calls handshake practice. So when something like that comes up, that kind of despair or self-loathing or sadness or sense of inadequacy, you don't suppress it. You don't repress it. You look at it and you handshake it and you say, hi, okay. Yep. Welcome. Okay. Yeah, that too. Yeah, I feel that. I feel that sadness and that sense of 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 loserdom. And then 
And then you kind of laugh at it, right? Because you're like, wow, really? Is it that? And he also says this wonderful thing. He's, he, often, he often says um, uh, one, of, one, of, one of his kind of mantras, it, which my, my son, who likes Soak Room Share as well, enjoys, is who cares? So what? And so, and he says, if, if that's not spiritual enough for you, you can add om, so who cares? So you say, om, who cares? So what? In this kind of <laughs> Tibetan, Tibetan accent that he has. And so, so you watch this stuff as it arises. You see what you're subject to, the emotions that you're subject to, whether it's fear or anger or jealousy or, or hatred or sadness or depression or worry or whatever it is. You see it arise. And instead of immediately fleeing from it, you, you kind of, you welcome it, but you don't, you don't kind of fall into, oh my God, yeah, I've got to chase after this anxiety or this fear or this despair. You're just like, okay, yeah, that's a, hi, hi, welcome to the party. Right. And, and, and what this guy, David Hawkins, who I spent a lot of time studying would say, he, he wrote a book called Letting Go, that I think is a very important book. I, I definitely, um, draw your listeners attention to chapter two of that which discusses this this mechanism of letting go what he says is that the resistance to these emotions is what gets us in trouble it's it's when these negative thought patterns come up or these negative is not even the right word but these 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 not very helpful thought patterns like despair or sadness or anger or whatever all of these things that we all have we all have our own particular flavor of of uh, of of, uh, of this stuff um, he says the problem is often that we suppress it, we repress it, we project it onto other people. So it may be, so for example, I could easily get myself into a state where I was so pissed off at the guy who had canceled at the last minute after I'd spent my entire Sunday preparing for this interview, working till like midnight and stuff, um, uh, not spending time with my wife as a result, only to have the interview canceled. Uh, I could be projecting my sense of, of inadequacy um an irrelevance um on this guy and get myself into a frenzy of anger but instead if i'm watching it then i can be like okay yep and then you can also let it go and so you can kind of surrender it and so it depends whether you have spiritual beliefs or anything like that but i i think you can i think there's deep wisdom in surrender in sort of saying all right i I don't know, what do I do about my sense of self-loathing mm -hmm. and inadequacy? I don't know, it comes from childhood. It comes from all the ways in which we were inadequate as kids or that we disappointed our parents or we disappointed our school teachers. Or, and it's just there, it just is. And so you just say, all right, I surrender that. I give that to the universe or to, to the creator or to you know my ancestors or righteous people who exist or Jesus or Buddha or... Uh, I mean, I'm Jewish and 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 I study Kabbalah mainly. That's uh, sort of my and so there are all of these righteous figures throughout history um, who are great Kabbalists. So you could literally just say, okay, I surrender this to them. It doesn't matter to the universe, but just that act of being aware of what's coming up and letting go of it, I think, is hugely hugely helpful. I, there's there's also a very useful book that I would recommend to your listeners called the surrender experiment which is a um i think it's on my pile here um which is by someone called michael singer and he talks about something very similar um and he's he's someone who he was a very brilliant guy um intellectually very brilliant who at a certain point just decided i'm going to start ignoring the voice inside my head whatever mickey singer wants me to do i'm just going to see what the universe is kind of asking me to do in this situation and I'm just gonna to surrender to it. And so he, he'd buy this property in Florida and he suddenly discovers, he looks at, he's like, wait, someone's building building a, a house on my property, what the hell? And he goes out and this woman says to him, yeah, I wanted to attend your meditations that you do on Saturday. And so I decided to build something on your, on your property. So he's like, he's outraged, right? And then he's thinking, well, maybe that's what the universe wants me to do. And so he's like, okay, I'll come help you. And so he goes and helps her build on his on his property. And so all of these extraordinary things happen to him as he surrenders his own his own sense of like this is how it must be. And so this is this is just one way of approaching the, these issues. But I I I think you've got to think about where you're going to get your equanimity, how you're going to deal with these negative emotions, the 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 fear, the uncertainty, and 
So I think one of the things, one of the most helpful things that I learned from this process of spending so much time interviewing great investors was that it's, it's not a side issue to focus on your inner landscape. It's central. And, and Guy Spear, who I know you interviewed, once said to me, I, I helped him write his book, The Educational Value Investor, which I think is very much worth reading for any of your listeners. He, he had this wonderful image for me once where he said that when he moved from New York, where I live, to, to Zurich, um, to this kind of slightly bland, very pleasant neighborhood in Zurich, he said it was very quiet. And it was great because his mind is all over the place, like mine, po po possibly even worse than mine. And he said, uh, although he might dispute that, uh, but if he's listened this far, he'll get distracted and he'll go off and do something else anyway, so we won't hear this bit. But he said, he said to me, you, you want your mind to be like a quiet pond, like a calm pond, so that when you throw a stone in it, you can actually see the ripples. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about that image, if I have something like this canceled interview yesterday, or if the market is crashing um, and I'm calm enough to see, oh, okay, there's fear, there's anxiety, then I'm less likely to be hijacked by it and more likely to be able to make a good decision. And also if I, if I think about what my friend Ken Schubenstein, the neurologist who taught at Columbia Business School would say, you know that you're gonna be able to get back to a base state sooner or, or later, like you're, when you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired, in pain, stressed, and you're getting flooded, you know that that's not gonna last. And so during those periods, you just wanna slow things down and just say, well, okay, well, I'm not gonna make a really huge decision in this moment. It, it, it's like, I remember when I was a teenager, um, some girl I was dating did something, I can't remember what, that broke my heart and I was absolutely miserable. And I was saying exactly the opposite of what I should say. You know, it's one of those things where you're like, I'm not gonna say this. And then you immediately say uh, the worst thing. And so, you know, and so you destroy these relationships when you're young, because you just didn't have control over your tongue. You know, to say, yeah, maybe maybe this is not the right moment to have the argument with my boss or my or or my wife or parent or something. And so, just knowing the degree to which life is an inner game, that investing is an inner game, and uh, anything, being a good employee, being a good friend, and so meditation is key. But I would also say exercise to a ridiculous extent is key, and. And I'm sort of embarrassed to say this because we all know about the many benefits of exercise. But when, when COVID started, I was thinking, okay, this is, this is very much a way that the great investors would think. Um, not, not that I'm a great investor. I, I was thinking, okay, so what can I control and what can't I control? I can't control the fact that um, there's, this, there's this new disease that none of us really understand and that can mutate. I can't control the mutations. I can't control public policy. I can't control the politicization of public policy where people are like not willing to wear masks or um, so I can't control other people's behavior. What can I control? Well, I can control social distancing. I can control whether I wear a mask. I can control whether I get vaccinated when the vaccines come along. And I'm not saying this in any political way. I'm just thinking, what are the things I can control? And I can control my own weight and my own fitness because we know that being very heavy and unhealthy is a precondition for lots of illness. So, so we now know much more clearly that it's also, it also makes you much more vulnerable to COVID. But what I was thinking then is, well, I don't know how serious COVID is, but I can see the stats on heart disease and high blood pressure and cancer and all of these things. And I know, and stroke, and I can see that if I take control of exercise and my diet, um, which is very difficult for me because I'm sedentary and lazy and like to sit and read um, and not move. Um, I know that I stack the odds in my favor of a successful outcome of, a, of getting to a decent destination. And so what I did is right at the start of COVID, we, we bought a Peloton and, and, and I've probably done 700 rides since then in over two years. And that for me is an extraordinary thing. So, so I took control of my health and fitness to some degree, not, not perfectly. I mean, I still then bothered to 
stretch much or do weights or any of the other things I know are good for me. Um, but I tilted the odds in my favor and controlled what I could control. And the joke is that after all of these decades full of existential angst and worry about world and deep thoughts about life, I found that I just became happier when I exercised, that it just has this ridiculously powerful impact on on your on your mind and your emotions and so again just think about think about how you're going to create internal equanimity because that's what you can control and so you control your health you control your mental health you're playing the cards that you've been dealt as well as possible and then all of the other stuff kind of radiates out from that if there's a calm center think about how much better your your decision making is going to be um, how much better your relationships will be because you're just more decent to people because you're not torpedoed by stress. And when right. I think about the times when I was horrible to my children, it was almost always because I was really stressed. You know, I'd be, I'd be trying to finish a chapter that was killing me and I couldn't understand it and, and the, everything was going badly. I knew I was way behind on my deadline. And, and my son, uh, Henry, who I love dearly, he was a wonderful, wonderful human being, would be playing guitar and and singing outside my room and I'd be like stop and and he'd be like what do you mean and and you know and so it was my stress and his stress multiplied and when I and when I went out and I was sort of in a better mood um you'd be like uh Hen, do, you, do you think you could hold it just like half an hour I'm just wrestling with this last paragraph and you'd be like oh, okay sure 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 um and so this stuff sounds so stupid and so platitudinous and so banal and so obvious that most of us don't really think about it. But I, I just think you want to spend an enormous amount of time thinking about how to, how to, how to create inner peace and calm, whether it's through prayer, meditation, exercise, um, mm -hmm. walking in the woods, uh, it, and, and it's swimming. It's different for each of us. And, and so, again, it's not, about, it's not about playing somebody else's game. It's about finding what works for you. Right. And, and you even said in the book for, for people who know they need to exercise more. Right. And COVID definitely set back almost everyone in terms of exercise. Um, you laid out in the book of uh, one of the investors. I can't remember his name right now at the top of my head, but just run five minutes a day. If yeah, you run Tom five, Gaynor. Yeah. Tom Gaynor. Yeah. Run five minutes a day. And then next week, run 10 minutes a day. Yeah. And, and, and then just start to compound and get one percent better every day with these little actions. And um, I guess whatever you're compounding in life by, by focusing on the internal game and exercise and yeah. relationships, you're just increasing longevity allows you to compa compound your, whether it's investing or your career yeah. or goodwill. Um, it's, it's amazing what can happen. And I'm realizing that um, <laughs> as time goes on. And so making sure our, I'm compounding the right things that matter to me and hopefully other people compounding the things that matter to them and figuring that out and saying no, kind of going yeah. back to what you said, saying no to compounding things that don't matter to you, I think could be um, a, a big thing. And when you're, when you're in your twenties, it's, it's really hard to say no because you need that opportunity, right? Yeah. As you get older, it's easier, but a lot of the great investors in your book, they, it's like they knew their Dharma. <laughs> At a, yeah. at a very young age. Um, and I guess they did this internal game and were lucky to find it or they just knew how to find that early on in life. Yeah, and what, what, you, what you've said about compounding is very profound that it's, and it, it makes me really happy that you've internalized this idea to such an extent that it's, it's thinking about compounding in multiple ways. So usually people think about compounding wealth. Um, you know, how am I going to compound money in the stock market? And, it's, and, and so one of the great lessons that I learned from Guy Spear, who we mentioned before, is this idea of compounding goodwill. And it sounds really trite, like most of these truths, they sound kind of banal. Um, but the idea of compounding goodwill turns out to be one of the most powerful lessons I've learned in life. So, so if you just start by being nice and decent to people and treating people respectfully and and trying to be kind. I mean, we all screw up constantly. I, I don't want to set myself up <laughs> as any sort of as any sort of saint. I've done all sorts of crappy things. Um, but if you know that that's a goal, and you know that it's a benefit, and you started early, 
what's really striking about these good habits, like compounding goodwill, behaving, behaving decently to people, is that the benefits don't seem that striking in the short term. So once in a while, you, you do something in the short term where you're nice to someone and you see an immediate payoff and you're like, that's weird. I, like this thing happened and then this thing happened and that's weird. But part of what's tricky about life when you're in your 20s, I think, is, is that you don't have the data points. You don't have the evidence to say, oh, wow, that really worked. And so there's kind of this leap of faith where you're like, well, I'll try to be less of a prick. And, and you're like, I don't know, is that a good idea or not? Because actually we know, like, there's actually a sense that maybe it's kind of naive to be decent and ethical and moral and kind. Like maybe, maybe if you're in the workplace and it's super competitive, maybe you have an advantage being sharp elbowed and unpleasant and, and nobody really tells you the rules of the game. And so early on in my life, I think I, I, you know, I was a journalist. I was working in places like Forbes and Time Magazine. These are very rapacious, cutthroat, competitive places with lots of really smart people pushing for space in the magazine, trying to get higher on on the masthead. And it was and it was a difficult business that was becoming smaller because it was challenged by the internet. And so it's very easy to internalize the idea that no, I need to take care of myself and stand up for myself and be a snake and be sharp and and what I, what I gradually have come to believe, and I, I, I may be wrong, and, it's, and I think you have to be true to yourself. I think there's an overwhelming competitive advantage that comes from being consistently decent over time. And what you discover, this is something that Tom Gaynor mentions in the book, where he, he says one of his advantages is I'm a nice guy. And so he says, there's so many people who wish me well, who are reaching out to help me. Uh, and I saw this recently, I organized a private event where it was just for about 35 people at an investment firm in New York. And I asked Tom Gaynor, who's CEO of, co-CEO of a Fortune 400 company who manages like 19,000 people or something like that and 20, 20 private companies and very important, very successful guy, manages over $20 billion, I think. I said, would you come and speak? There's nothing in it for him. And he takes a train for six hours from Virginia to New York and spends the night and comes and talks for an hour. I interviewed him at this event, just kind, just incredibly kind. But think about that kind of behavior compounded over decades. Think about all of the people who wish Tom well because of the way he behaves. And so when Tom's looking to hire someone or when, um, when he's going through a difficult period, people are gonna be supportive of him. And, I think it's much like things like exercise and meditation, where you don't, you see a bit of the benefit on the day that you exercise or on the day that you meditate. Maybe, maybe you feel that much less stressed or that, or, or that much more self-righteous because you did something good or whatever, but it's not like you're thinner or, you know, because you exercised mm-hmm. or you suddenly look incredibly handsome or, uh, I mean, in your case, maybe, but in mine, it's still a challenge. But if you meditate for 10, 12 minutes a day for five, 10 years, two years, 20 years, it becomes an overwhelming advantage. And I, I see this, there's a, there's a famous writer, a guy called Dan Goldman, who wrote this book on EQ, on emotional intelligence, that's, that sold more than 5 million copies over the years. And I've become friends with him and he's, I, I, I don't see him a great deal, but he's someone who's meditated for 40, 50 years. And I tell you, when you're in his presence, you see someone who's deeply calm and deeply present. And when I look at that, he, he's, he's older than I am. And I look at him and I think, that's what I want to be when I grow up. He's not only a really successful writer, but he's very deeply present and very deeply calm. And so you see the benefits of these behaviors compounding over decades. And so I think if there's a takeaway here for for our listeners, again, it's to think about the destination, think about what you want to become, the type of person you want to be in terms of your health, in terms of your career, in terms of your relationships, in terms of your finances, your financial independence, and then work backwards and think about what's going to get me there. What are the inputs? And then pick a handful of habits to use Tom Gaynor's phrase, which I find incredibly helpful, 
habits that are directionally correct. So they don't have to be optimal. You don't have to say, um, you know, it's like, look, if you looked at my arms, they're like pathetically <laughs> thin. And, you know, I know that I should be doing weights. I know that it, it's important. And I used to do it, but I, I sort of stopped when, when, when we left our gym during COVID and used the excuse not to start again. But at least I'm directionally correct in the fact that I'm exercising probably 150 to 200 minutes a week, which is a really good amount to exercise, I think, mm -hmm. based on what I've learned um, from my crappy rudimentary study of this stuff. So it's a directionally correct habit. I don't meditate every day, but I try to meditate pretty consistently. Um, it's directionally correct. Um, I have a morning connection, I call it, where I do a few prayers from um, a Kabbalistic prayer book that, that put my mind in a particular place that I do I'd probably six times a week, something like that. And, and one of the things that you're doing is you're focusing on other people. And so you're getting out of your own head. And you're also, there are things like, there's a, there's a, I'm not in any way trying to be a proselytizer. I mean, I've, I've gone through all of the phases. I've been an atheist, I've been agnostic, and I've become increasingly spiritual as I'm older. So you, so you know that I'm wrong at some point. You, you know, like I've had all the positions, so you know I've been wrong. But um, one, of, one of the prayers, for example, has a Hebrew word emet, which means truth. You say it over and over again, it re recurs. And, and, and so one of the things you're, you're asking, I mean, I, I did it this morning, literally, I'm saying, please bless me with the attribute of truth and truthfulness. And that's just the, the consciousness behind it. So then when I'm coming to do an interview like this, I'm thinking, well, is this about trying to sell books and trying to puff up my ego and trying to be self-important? Or is it like, no, let me try to be a conduit for truth in some way to pass on information, insight that's helpful and that's true. And none of us really know whether what we're saying is true, but just to, just to have the desire to be a conduit for truth and for uh, something that's gonna you know, um, shift the direction of the world a little bit in, in the direction of truth and kindness and mercy and compassion and all of these virtues. So, so this is one of the things that I'm, I'm doing every morning, but again, it's deeply personal. I'm not in any way trying to proselytize, but before I start, I'm like, let me give strength to love, mercy, kindness, compassion, truth, oneness. And I would have rolled my eyes at this 20 years ago. I would have looked at myself and been like, what a moron, not only a moron and a dupe and full of wishful thinking, but a proselytizing moron dupe full of wishful thinking. And now I think, well, I've probably done this for 13, 14 years at this point. And so I can actually see that I rewired my brain. But at a certain point, when you keep, when you keep pounding in the same message, whether it's through prayer or meditation or, or reading the same texts the whole time or affirmations, anything you want to do, you're rewiring your brain. So if your default position is to be anxious or self-pitying or to feel like a victim, and instead you say, this is something I learned from Arnold Vandenberg, who's the last, the last person I write about in the book, who's in many ways the most inspiring person in the book because he transformed his life after going through the, the Holocaust. Um, he had every reason to feel like a victim and to be full of rage and anger. He was, he, he, 39 members of his family died in the Holocaust. And his, uh, you know, he was, his father used to beat him up and his, uh, he was in an orphanage when he was a kid and his, uh, uh, his first wife left him for another man. I mean, he had so many things go wrong and he barely made it through high school and everyone thought he had brain damage. And what he did is he totally transformed his inner landscape. And so partly he did it by hypnotizing himself, but partly he did it through affirmations. And so when he was full of rage, he would literally be saying, no, no, I'm a loving person. And he would just say to himself over and over again, I'm a loving person. So, so if I remind myself constantly that I want to be a conduit for truth, um, I, I, or if I want to be, I just want to be kinder. Um, yeah. So even though I keep screwing up and I keep doing stupid self-destructive things, or I keep behaving in a way that I'm kind of ashamed of or whatever, but if I keep coming back to that true north of saying, let me just try to be kinder, um, that's such a that that simple understanding 
is so overwhelmingly powerful if you keep at it. I mean, if you, so it's, so it's knowing what's important to you. So I, I wrote about this in the first chapter of the book, right? Where I wrote about Monish Pabright, who's a great cloner. He, he, he copies what other people have figured out who are smarter than him, wiser than him, older than him, like Buffett and Munger, who become mentors to him. And he says, okay, so what can I learn from these people? And then Munger says, take a simple idea and take it seriously. So one of the things that, that Monish has learned is, I'm going to be truthful, because partly what happened is he studied David Hawkins, the guy we talked about before, um, who wrote that book, Letting Go. And Hawkins wrote a very important book called Power Versus Force. I really encourage our listeners to, to read. And Monish gets the idea from that book, I'm just going to tell the truth, because if I tell the truth, it kind of resonates at a higher level. And people will sense whether I'm lying or telling the truth. And it's going to draw better people into my life. And it's worked astonishingly well. For me, I ended up concluding in, in that chapter, yeah, I want to be more truthful. But I thought, well, I think there's tremendous power in cloning this idea of focusing on one great virtue that you come back to again and again. And I think truth is really important. Being truthful is really important. Not being a liar is important. But for me, and maybe this is just my excuse so I can get away with being a liar more, um, I think kindness is probably the one that trumps everything for me. And so I think if I can be directionally correct over the next, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, however long I have, uh, you know, God, God willing, it's not like just three months because I've, I've got a lot of work to do on this front. Um, um, if I can focus on becoming kinder and consistently come back to that true north, then you can look and you can say, all right, so, so I can still be full of annoyance at the guy who cancelled on me yesterday. Um, or self-pity or whatever, but it's okay because now I'm calm again. Now I've, I've looked at what came up. I've looked at my annoyance. I've looked at my sense that I'm just picking up crumbs from the table of great men, uh, the scraps from the table of great men. I'm like, yeah, okay, but let me, let me just focus on trying to be kinder, trying to be more decent, trying to be more loving. And, um, and that's directionally correct for me is more likely to get me to the end point of having really great relationships, loving relationships. And, um, and, and I do think this idea of compounding goodwill turns out to be professionally very powerful as well. So it's, so, you know, so you can find, you can find self-interested reasons for behaving kindly and decently as well. <laughs> you can justify it because people, people trust you. And so you're going to work with better people because they trust you. I mean, you look at Buffett and Munger, part of their advantage is that they're surrounded by really high quality people who want to be in that orbit. It's because they've been honest. They're not just, yeah. it's not just because they're really smart. I mean, if you, well, if you were if you're choosing I, who to do a deal with, you do it yeah, with them, right? And I know um, the guy was telling me that Warren Buffett sends Christmas cards yeah. to a lot of individuals and how much a simple act yeah, just like that can make a huge difference in someone's life. It's not like you have to do something extravagant to yeah. change someone's life. Yeah, I had this discussion. I, I I started a new podcast recently, and there's a so I've been interviewing people like Ray Dalio and and Howard Marks and Joel Greenblatt. It, it's a it, amazing. It's the, yeah. Oh, thanks. It's got the same <laughs> name. It's Richard White's a Happier Podcast, and there's an episode coming up with um, Aswath de Modaran, who's a famous NYU professor who's an expert on valuation. And it hasn't come out yet and I haven't edited it yet. There's a point in it, I think about two thirds of the way through this long conversation where he talks about um, these little acts of kindness. And he says something that literally it stopped me in my tracks. So you'll hear in the interview, I, I, I say that what you said just stopped me in my tracks because he's talking about um, sometimes when you're interviewing somebody, you interviewing somebody, you hear something that you're like, oh, that's deep truth. Like what I just heard, that's deep truth. And sometimes it actually brings you up in chills because you realize it's true. And he was talking, I think he mentioned somebody in Iran who had written to him and he, he gets something like 300 emails a day and he tries to respond and he tries to help people despite this constant cascade of stuff coming to him. And so even if it's 20 seconds, he'll say, go look at this, go look at this, maybe contact this person, that sort of thing. And someone had written to him, I think, and said, that response that you gave me totally and utterly transformed my life. Like, like I think this guy left Iran, ended up becoming a money manager, stuff like something like that. I'm gobbling this. But that idea that these little actions can change the world 
And so, so you look at Buffett, um, Buffett, Buffett reads Guy's annual report and sends him a note a few months ago saying how much he liked his annual report. There's nothing in it for Buffett to do that. It's just, it's just, you know, this 90 something year old guy spreading goodwill because he can being kind because he can. And, and maybe knowing that his life is better if that's how he behaves, because it's not just that people like you more and respect you more, which, which is good for your ego. And maybe it's good for your business and stuff like that. You have more self-respect if you behave in a good way. I, I remember I used to, this is so embarrassing thing to say. Um, I sometimes find now when I'm passing a mirror, I look at myself and I smile. I'm like, God, I never used to do that. And just looking at yourself and being closer to liking yourself because you behave better. <laughs> uh, and I've still got a long way to go, but that's an enormous benefit. And so I, I write about this a bit in the epilogue of the book. I'm trying to talk about what actually constitutes a successful and abundant life. And it's, it's not about wealth maximization. You, you do... I, I, I don't in any way diminish the importance of money because I, I think there's nothing worse. Well, there are many things worse, but, but, but it's pretty crappy to have that fear of not having enough money, to feel that you're trapped and to feel that kind of corrosive worry that you're not going to be able to pay the next bill or you're not going to be able to, to take care of your kids. Or um, That's a horrible feeling. No, I, I don't think anyone, anyone wants to go through that. So I'm, I'm not in any way diminishing the importance of having money so that you can be financially independent and free so that you can do the job that you want, go on the trips that you want, live in a nice home. Um, it's not about being flashy or anything like that, but, but to have that kind of independence, that kind of freedom to, to say no to projects that you don't want to do things like that. That's incredibly valuable, but you don't want to fall into the delusion of thinking that money, power, fame, success, reputation, that all of these things are going to make you happy because they're so, um, they're so fragile and superficial. And so this is one of the things that I, if, if any of your listeners do read the book, I'd really draw your attention to that epilogue because, because when, you're, when you're choosing the destination you want in life, you don't want to spend 50 years chasing after the wrong thing. And, be, and, and this is one reason why a lot of middle-aged people like me ended up, um, as I did in my 40s, I'm now 53, in my 40s, I had a sort of existential crisis where suddenly you're like, oh my God, I did all of these things to become successful and I'm miserable. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, I, I mean, I became the editor of the international editions of Time and I was sort of, you know, flying around feeling self-important, interviewing presidents and prime ministers. And then I get laid off. And then suddenly you're like, well, so it wasn't, no, I, I, you know, all of the, all of the respect and stuff I got where I could go interview the British prime minister or the Indian prime minister or something, you know, it's all mm -hmm. gone. And so that was really fragile. And so knowing that it's not about the wealth, the reputation, the power, stuff like that, it's actually the, things like building powerful relationships um again seems like, like a platitude but but you know ed thorpe this guy i write about who's i describe as the greatest game player in the history of investing is a guy who he figured out how to count cards right he's the guy who invented <laughs> that whole thing figured out how to beat the casino at roulette even uh i mean just a brilliant brilliant guy when i talked to him about how to approach the game of life if you treated life as a game that you were trying to crack in the same way that he cracked the game of roulette or the game of blackjack or the game of managing hedge fund. He said, well, look, the, the most important thing is who you spend your time with. And it's so obvious, but if you think about it, then you're like, oh, so why don't I try to get better people into my life? And so how am I going to get better people into my life? Well, I'm going to have to behave decently because why would good quality people want to be in my life if I suck? <laughs> And so just having just, it's, it's, it's a bit like the deferred gratification question that we discussed before with Nick Sleep. It's not that you're gonna bat perfectly. 
it's that at least you know that's the game. At least you want to be less superficial. At least you want to be deferring gratification and not going for the quick hit of dopamine. At least you know that you want to be trying to become kinder. You know that you want to try to become more truthful. Um, you want to try to get better people in your life um, and not just chase after money and fame and power and all of these things. And so just knowing knowing what what the playground is in which you're playing knowing what the game is is a huge head start and so that that that's part of what i'm trying to define in writing the book and in interviewing all of these people is to say oh that's what works that's that's this is how the smartest people alive the most practical smartest most pragmatic people alive this is what they figured out about what works and doesn't work mm -hmm. it's a great phrase from munger where he says i study what works and doesn't work and why and so this is the shortcut that I'm trying to give to our listeners and to my readers and to myself, because I'm lost half the time, is to say, oh, that's what works. And then if you try to be directionally correct in all of these different ways, over time, it becomes overwhelmingly powerful. In the short term, you won't necessarily see the difference, but, but you stick at it from your 20s until your 50s, your 60s, your 70s, it's overwhelming. And, and it's... It's very much the same path with investing. If you, if you live within your means and you keep tucking away money in tax deferred vehicles like IRAs, 529 plans, 401k plans, it seems so banal and meaningless in the short term because you look and you're like, oh, wow, I just put away $5,000. That's going to help me retire. And then you look back 10, 20, 30 years later and you're like, oh, yeah, that's a few hundred thousand dollars now. And another double which is like 10% returns a year for seven years, and it's over a million. And then another seven years, mm. and it's a couple of million, three million, and then it's 10 million. And, and so that, that idea of dogged incremental progress over time, that's profoundly important. And, yeah. and the great advantage that your listeners have is that they're starting early. And so if you start with good habits early on in all of these areas, exercise, health, relationships, getting control over your inner landscape, over your mind, your, your, your ability to handle stress and uncertainty, knowing how to distinguish between what you can control and what you can't control, living within your means, saving, um, exercise, meditation, all of these good habits. And you don't have to do everything. You don't have to be optimal. You want to be directionally correct. Pick a few. And, and so there's a, there's a beautiful line that I quote from Munger, where he says, take a simple idea and take it seriously. And so when you come across one of these ideas, like deferring gratification, cloning what people who are smarter than you know, uh, and have figured out already, being directionally correct, adopting habits that are going to compound over time, like compounding goodwill, you don't have to pick all of them, but find a few things that resonate deeply for your personality, where you're just like, I, you know, with a lot of truths in life, you knew it already. And yeah. somebody says something, you're like, oh, okay. And so in a way, it's the stuff that you know already in your own mind, and it gets activated by someone saying it. And then you're like, okay, I'm going to be less with prick for the next 50 years. <laughs> I'm going to try to be kinder and to, yeah. to guard what I say, because, because I know that being kind is an overwhelming priority if the goal in life is to have great relationships that are really rich and fulfilling and have great experiences with people and have great partners. And, and so there's a, there's a beautiful line from um, Munger where he says, um, if you want to have a good partner, be a good partner. And so if you apply that to every area, if you apply that to friendship, if you want to have good friends, be a good friend. And so these truths are not super complicated, but as, but as Munger says about investing, it's simple, not easy. And all I, of these things are simple, not easy. It's, it's, I can't tell you how hard it is for me to control my eating. Um, you know, it's like I stress eat and I get bored and I, you know, and I like bread and stuff. You know, it's not easy for me to keep mm -hmm. my health in gear. It's not easy for me to keep getting on the Peloton. Well, and a lot of this may seem trite, 
but yeah. it's only because you see these these quick Instagram quotes where you don't mm. internalize anything. <laughs> yeah, and, and so yeah. although it is, it may seem common to some. Very very few people actually internalize it, set it as a habit, yeah. um, and, and start to reinforce it on a daily basis. Yeah. Where that becomes them. Um, yeah. And, and I think that's why I've read your book three times at this point, uh, because thanks. I'm trying to internalize this cheat code and ingrain it into my soul. <laughs> and that, uh, that's, yeah. that's, a, that's, that's wonderful. And that's exactly what I'm after. I, it's, it's, not, it's not something that you want to look at uh, uh, and say, yeah, here's a good idea. And then your eyes glaze over and you move <laughs> on to the next thing. You, you want to take a few simple but powerful ideas and make them a part of your soul. Something like cloning, even on a very simple level, like, like years ago when I was coming out, when I was deciding to set up my website, um, williamgreen.com was gone. So I'm like, what does Michael Lewis do? Michael Lewis, a great writer. And I look at Michael Lewis's website and it's uh, michaellewiswrites.com. I'm like, okay, williamgreenwrites.com. And then I look at my friend Malia and she's got maliaboydwrites.com and I can see she's just cloned what I did. And I remember at one point I did a, I did a, an event with Harvard. Um, I guess it was uh, the Harvard club in New York. And this brilliant woman interviews me on, uh, there. And, and it was a, you know, it was a virtual event. It was a, whatever, like six 30 in the evening or five 45 or something. And then I was going to do an event with Guy Spear. And I just said to him, well, the Harvard club, their virtual events are at this time. And he's like, okay, we'll do it that. And, and it wasn't even, we didn't even discuss this for three seconds. We just cloned what these people who were really smart had figured out already. And so you can do it in really small ways, but then you can also say, okay, I can clone Munger saying, if you want to have a good partner, be a good partner. And then if you really take that seriously, then you say, well, what is a good partner? And then you start thinking, well, so it's someone who's not just out for themselves. It's someone. So there's a there's a wonderful thing in in this book by Janet Lowe that's a biography of of Munga, where there's a forward from Buffett, and Buffett says something like, "In in 41 years, I've never seen Charlie try to take advantage of anyone." And he says, I, "I've seen him knowingly take the worst end of the deal on multiple occasions, and when there's blame." Uh, he takes more, more of the blame than he's due and less of the credit than he's due. And so you think about that. You think about this as one, of, it's basically the most successful financial partnership in history between Buffett and Munger. And it's built on that, mm. on, on that kind of honesty and decency. And then you look at Nick Sleep's partnership with Case Sicaria and, and Nick said, it's a relationship built on kindness. And so years after they closed down the Nomad Fund, this hedge fund that had made astronomical returns, they still share an office on the King's Road in London. And they don't go there very often. Like, but when I went there years ago to interview them, it's still got, you know, Nick, uh, you know, Zach doesn't even have a have a desk. He has like this, this big leather comfy chair, sort of easy chair that he can lean back on. I mean, they were super informal. But the fact that years after they closed down their business, they still want to share an office. That's, that's a successful relationship. And so just knowing, take, taking a simple idea like cloning and understanding its ramifications in every area of your life, small and big, that, that's hugely powerful. Mm -hmm. so, so, so the fact, Jeremy, that you're picking a few things and you're pounding it into your brain over and over again, that's, I think that's the secret. I think it's, it's again, it's, it's removing a lot of complexity. And going yes. narrow and deep. Well, and, uh, you know, coming to the realization where we set up all these novelty ideas in our head where if I make a million dollars, then I'll be happy. Right? Yeah. And stress is just part of the human condition. And once you make a million dollars, then you're just thinking about, okay, well, how do I not lose this a million dollars? And the stress just switches. So, yeah. Um, it, it then just becomes a matter of, well, what? what would I be really happy to do and specialize on and, 
And even if I'm stressed, I love what I do. And instead of thinking about all these quick gimmicky ways or being Bobby Axelrod from billions. Yeah. (laughs) um, And so, yeah, uh, it is really the path of being richer, wiser, happier, which opens personally the possibility to greater wealth versus, hey, let me try and get rich quick and uh, be miserable in the process. Well, what you, what you're looking for is a kind of true abundance, and so to understand what constitutes true abundance is a really is a really valuable thing. And so, so there's no question at all that what the money gives you is independence. The, the for for me, I'm not super rich or anything, but but I've done well enough that I don't have to do projects that I don't want to do. I can't tell you what a gift that is. Not to have to work for people who are assholes or who are bullies or that like that is such for for my particular personality which is kind of profoundly independent um and profoundly uh intolerant of bullies and thugs and the like and untalented people who think they're really talented and (laughs) you know like like and impose their view on you i mean yeah you know which i'm sure applies to me as well um that's really important to me and so so to know that i'm prepared to sacrifice a lot of money to to do the work that's true to who i am that i value and that where i can add value in the world that's a really valuable lesson that I've learned from the great investors. So you're you're trying constantly to figure out what real wealth actually is. And it's not, it's not the flashy car. I mean, maybe you're someone who really just absolutely adores the design of a Ferrari or a Maserati or something. I, I think I think they're great. I just don't give a damn. I I literally I somehow have managed in more than seven years not to get my car washed once. Uh, and it's, uh, I think there are a few times where my wife has kind of capitulated, you know, I just don't care. That's just not, that's not what I care about, but that I really value. And it's really interesting and having the time to have a conversation like this or to, to read and to think and to meditate and to write and to, um, to study that, that is so valuable to me. I can't even tell you. And so so to know that for me, that's what constitutes an abundant life is really, really important. So when I was just thinking, if I make X amount, it's going to fill this hole, this big psychic hole, uh, and it's going to make me feel full. And it's like, no, pretty, I, I'm not saying this in any way to be self-congratulatory. Pretty much the first thing I did this morning, pretty much the only thing I did this morning is I gave away some money to a cause that is deeply idiosyncratic. I mean, it's it's... It's uh, uh, I didn't tell my wife this, so luckily she won't listen to this. Either. But it's a, it's a translation of an ancient text. Um, so it's a really beautiful and really important text that's written in Hebrew. And so I'm contributing to, to that. Um, that, I mean, that's valuable to me. Yeah. It's a very profound spiritual text that is probably 500 years old and that hasn't been translated into English. And so just to know the part of an abundant life for me is actually not to be controlled by money, not to feel like um, I've got to make more. I've got to hoard. I've got to, you know, I've had so much fear about money over the years. And so part of, part of what giving money away does for you is it releases that sense of um, fear and that sense of hoarding and that sense of, I, I'm not going to have enough. And what if I don't have enough? And I'm, I'm not, suggesting that people should be reckless about giving money away. Um, But understanding that you have these things to give, whether it's your money, your time, your love, your insights, your wisdom, um, your physical strength, whatever it is. And and if they're just for you, you're going to have a stunted life. Whereas if you share them, you're going to have a happier life. And so just understanding the principles of the, the universal principles of life, then you're like, oh yeah, so I should give money away. I should make that actually a consistent part of what I should do because it, I, I mean, I just felt happier after doing it. And so, so, so it's about 
it's about learning these universal laws of life, what works and what doesn't work and why. And then, and then just plugging away in a directionally correct place. So, so yeah, we can't control what's going to happen with um, the geopolitical situation, with, with the epidemiological situation, which yeah. is a word I don't get to use very often, um, <laughs> uh, and I'm probably misusing, with climate. I mean, we can have a little impact on these things, um, and, and we should try. I mean, I mean, we should think carefully about who we vote for and who we give money to and stuff like that, but we can control our own behavior. And, and that radiates out in ways that are really powerful. And so this is an ancient Stoic truth, right? That you, the Stoic philosophers in Rome and Greece really, really concentrated on distinguishing between what they could control and what they couldn't control. Right. And likewise, I, I interviewed Ray Dalio recently, he's the most successful hedge fund manager of all time. Um, financially, I mean, made tens of billions of dollars for his shareholders and he had lost his son. Um, who died in a car accident. And I, I was talking to him about how he dealt with it. And one of the things he said he's found really helpful is the serenity prayer, which is, you know, again, it's about distinguishing between what you, what you can and can't control, being at peace with what you can't control. So again, it gets to that idea we were talking about before of surrender, of, of letting go of what you can't control. Um, and really focusing, focusing on, there's so much that you can control in terms of your own mindset, your own behavior. And right. so, so far from feeling disempowered or worried about the future, I think your, your listeners should be feeling really pretty excited about it. That if they take control of their own behavior and their own thoughts, particularly your thoughts, which, I mean, you, you, your inner life, your consciousness, the way you speak to yourself, the way you, um, the way you think has such a profound impact on um, on what happens in your life. Mm -hmm. That the, the results over decades are going to be overwhelming. And you'll look back at 30, 40, 50, you'll be like, really? That actually worked? That that experiment? Um, and that's a that's a magnificent thing. And so so if I if I can help to speed things along. For you, so you make fewer mistakes than I made along the way. Don't chase after the wrong thing. That's uh, that. That would be a wonderful thing. So I hope in 20, 30 years you'll be saying that worked. <laughs> and thank you for that. And I would highly recommend the audience go, go look at the book "Richer, Wiser, Happier." Uh, definitely worth your time. Um, I just want to say thank you for the amazing insights, wisdom. Um, making all of us wiser and happier. Huh. <laughs> the goal Hopefully being happier. richer. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully richer. Um, yeah. Is it, uh, before uh, we just, we go, is there um, anywhere people can find you that you prefer uh, so they can check out your work besides the book? Sure. Uh, I, I'm relatively active on Twitter where uh, I'm William Green 72. I'm on LinkedIn. People are welcome to follow me, connect with me, message me. I, I like hearing from people. I, I'm not always on top of replying to them, but I do try. <laughs> and uh, um, and my website, as I mentioned, WilliamGreenWrites.com. And I I would I would encourage you to listen to the new podcast, which is the Richer Wise Happier podcast, because I've I've had these long in depth conversations with people like Howard Marks and Joel Greenblatt, who I and there's a new one with Jason Zweig, who's a terrific uh, columnist at the Wall Street Journal, who. Um, also edited and updated The Intelligent Investor, which is the, what Buffett describes as by far the best book about investing ever written. And so they're in-depth conversations where you're talking about these issues of how to invest, how to think better, but also how to live more wisely. And I, I think part of, part of the secret in life is to create a kind of intellectual environment intellectual, spiritual, philosophical environment, uh, physical environment for yourself in which you're going to thrive. And I think you want to pick some really good role models in life who are honorable, decent, successful, smart, wise people who you admire. And, and none of these people are perfect. All of us are profoundly flawed and we do stupid stuff. Um, but, but, you, but you want to find a bunch of people who you admire um, and have them in your intellectual orbit. And so to spend time in the presence of people like Munger, Buffett, um, ben, ben Graham, Ben Franklin, they don't have to be alive. I mean, 
Um, Munger talks about hanging out with the eminent dead, um, people like Darwin and Einstein and, and uh, Richard Feynman and, and uh, Ben Franklin. He's like, I have had all my conversations with Ben Franklin. I don't need to have a dinner with Ben Franklin. I, you know, and, and so when you're listening to these people speak, um, you're creating a kind of environment for you that's reinforcing. And, and I was telling you before this conversation, Jeremy, you should go to Omaha for the, for the Birch Hathaway meeting. And one of the reasons you do it is because it reinforces good behavior. It's you're putting your, your, you're saying, I'm part of this team. And so you're aligning yourself with people who think long-term, who are honest about their mistakes, who um, treat their investors as partners, not as people they're going to rip off, but um, as people who are going to get wealthy with them, alongside them. And so choose your environment well. And so, so I think for me, yeah, I, I hope you'll listen to those conversations, but I hope you'll also do things like buy Joel Greenblatt's books, buy Howard Marks books, listen to their other podcasts, listen to Munger speak, read Munger's book, Poor Charles Almanac. Um, keep, keep being careful about um, who you have in your environment and, and, and have them support good behavior. There's a, there's a, there's a great, uh, I, I'm pretty ignorant about Buddhism, but I'm doing a course at the moment um, uh, that I'm live streaming. Um, and they talk about taking refuge in um, uh, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. And so Buddha, you know, so it's like the light, God, whatever, whatever you want to think. Um, uh, Dharma, the truth, like Torah, Old Testament for me. Um, and Sangha, which is like community. And so you need your Sangha. You need your community that reinforces good behavior. And so if you're hanging out with the Guy Spears and the Monish Pabrites, people who care about truth and care about treating people decently and honorably, uh, they, their, their behavior has been reinforced by hanging out with Buffett and Munger. Right. And, and so create that environment for yourself. And, and, and it's good if it's physical. If you, can go, if you can go be in their physical orbit, great. But you can also just read Buffett's shareholder letters. Um, you can listen to his, his lectures. And so, so, yeah, sorry, this is a very long-winded way of answering your question. But I think, but I think it's important. Choose, choose your environment carefully. Um, there's, a, there's a great Kabbalist called Rav Ashlag who said how important it is to choose the right environment because you won't change your environment. Your environment will change you. And so, and, and this goes back to what Buffett says, where he says, hang out with people who are better than you and you can't help but improve. Mm -hmm. So you're constantly trying to hang out mentally, physically, spiritually, psychologically with people who, who are going to, who are going to tilt the balance for you because we all have both sides. Right. And right. So, so you just want to hang out with people who can tilt the balance towards being, being a decent, honorable, successful, productive human being. Amazing. Well, thank and, you so much. And with much. that, I'll shut up because otherwise you'll <laughs> never stop me talking. <laughs> no, amazing. Uh, I'm looking forward to everyone pulling insights from this. Uh, I definitely have myself. So definitely a lot of internal contemplation and thinking I will be doing in the woods afternoon about this conversation we had. So thank you so much. Um, ah, thank you. It's been a real delight. Perfect. And, and, and I wish all of your listeners much success on this journey. It's uh, it's it's a it's an unfolding adventure, but but if you if you if you follow some of these ideas that we've culled from these people, you'll 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 look back and you'll be like, wow, that, that worked. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you. If you like that video, check out this video right here with Guy Spear on the pursuit of building wealth and wisdom. I'll see you there. Investing is an infinite game. Jeff Bezos, he doesn't walk around saying, look how rich I am. If anything, he says, look at the amazing company that I've built.